something dramatic has happened in the last couple of decades on the energy barrier between an idea and getting that manifested as a product or service and getting it to market. If I, for that top line of, of faces there, I wouldn't need to put the names on them. They'd be, they're no more unrecognizable than, than, uh, than you two or the Rolling Stones. The bottom may be a little less visible, but Ashley Quayle delivered her first um, website aimed at 15-year-olds when she was 15. Um, she did it from her uh, mother's kitchen. Andrew, a RuneScape, um, some folks in here will probably be familiar with it. It's a, uh, it's a game, an online game, that um, uh, he hit his first $100 million at about 22 years of age. Robin Lee from China, um, who uh, has about 300,000 employees in a company called Baidu, an enormously impactful company. And our very own uh, Colston brothers um, with, uh, Shine, uh, with Stripe. They started with Shuffa, they're now with Stripe, worth about $2.7 billion. These are young people, they are relatively small teams, and they've done something in a business context and in an impact context that's dramatic. That if you go back um, to my youth, or if you go back through the centuries, nobody could do this kind of thing in this kind of time. So what happened that made this possible? Well, what happened was a dramatic shift in the enablement of an idea being manifested as a product or service, and that product or service going to market. And specifically, the revolution that has happened is on screens. You can create a product on a screen by downloading a, a, you know, a, 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 an environment, a development environment, and you can easily create a tool. You can manifest your idea as a product on that screen. And then how do you bring it to market? You load it to an app store. Are all of the millions of apps on the app stores brilliant? Of course they're not. But they cost very little to get there, probably an overdue credit card. And we have enormous companies like a Kodak or Polaroid that have disappeared off the face of the planet, while small companies are becoming huge in a very short period of time. And they're being done out of dorm rooms, and they're being done out of uh, kitchens and out of bedrooms. So something dramatic happened, and what happened was the energy barrier became really low. You needed a laptop, and you needed access to the internet, and then what really limited you was ideas. Does that sort of make sense? It's happened in the last 20 years. It's dramatic. There's a trillion dollar business worldwide in the digital economy, and it is, we've seen a lot of it, and we're enabling a lot of it through places like, and venues like uh, Coda Dojo. And it's, the recipe is well understood. Um, venue, places like Y Combinator have pulled our very own Colston brothers over there for, for Stripe, but Dropbox, um, Airbnb, and so on have all been nurtured in that environment. So collectively, we know how to take that idea and nurture it through to something large and complex. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alex, and this is Oshin and Anna. We are part of the Trinity Walton Club, and we're just finished second year in school. Our project is called Remember Me, and it's, device, it's a device that reminds you to take medication. In the Trinity Walton Club, we were asked to solve a problem that we had seen in the world, so we came together and made the Remember Me. The Remember Me is a band that you would wear on your wrist that reminds you to take your medication through a series of sounds, vibrations, and light signals. The inspiration for our project came from my brother, who has epilepsy, and our other team member who couldn't be here today, Leah, who also has epilepsy. They, people who have epilepsy have to take a lot of medication and it's very easy to forget to do this. We decided to make their lives easier by des designing a device which would remind you to take medication. So on the band there is a LCD screen which emits light signals, there's a buzzer which emits sound signals and then there is a vibrating motor which emits vibrations which can be felt on your arm. It can be worn as a watch so it's not as obvious to the human eye and it's powered by an Arduino, which is a microcontroller, and it is uh, powered by a battery. The Remember Me is not just confined to people who have epilepsy. It can be used for a range of different conditions. Um, for example, people who have diabetes can use it to remind them to, take, or to check their blood sugars, and carers can use it to remind them to administer medication. In our project, we had a buzzer, which um, we had during life, um, your ears start to degrade and the optimum sound for listening changes in everyone. So in our future work, um, the buzzer will be able to 
change to people's optimal frequency to listen to it. Other future works include making it more compact and also making it waterproof by using a more suitable material such as latex or rubber. We would also um, try to include a new feature which would be to include um, hospital appointments in, inside the um, memory which to remind you to go to the hospital if needed. Another component that we would like to enhance is the further is the buzzer. We would like to make it uh, self-adjusting to the sound level of a room. So if you're in a loud room, it, the sound would be just above the sound level of the room so that it could still be heard, or if you were in a quiet room, the same. And thank you for listening to us. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Brown, as Philip said. And I'm a final year in DCU. I actually just finished a few weeks ago and I'm 21, and the reason I'm standing here is that I won the Intel Galileo third level competition. What this competition was, it was open to any third level student that incorporated an Intel Galileo into their project. I got to the final, which was hosted in the Dublin Science Gallery, and I was the only girl in the final, and I went on to win it. <laughs> So what was my award-winning idea? I am a student, and last year I lived in shared accommodation with five other students. And when the electricity bills came in, they were absolutely through the roof. So I was wondering, where is this energy coming from, and how can I reduce these energy bills? And that was the motivation for my project. So the product, I wanted to build an energy monitoring system. I had a few goals for my product. I wanted it to be flexible, so the way I developed it in the future, I could easily add on new components. I wanted it to be flexible in the hardware and the software, and modular enough that I could attach it to more appliances in the future. Visually appealing. Spreadsheets are great and all, but that's not how we want to view our data. I wanted to make something that was colorful, appealing, and graphs and things like that and easy to understand. Before I made my final year project, I looked into kind of what else was on the market. And you can get these things that you plug into the wall to monitor your energy usage. A lot of them come back in terms of watts and amps, and I don't know about you, but 20 watts means nothing to me. So I wanted to display the data in a way that the user would understand. So my dashboard. This is my dashboard, and this is going to be the main kind of user interface. As you can see on the dashboard, I allow a user to set a budget of how much these appliances are allowed to use in a month. I have real-time data, so you can see the television, the microwave, and the fridge. They're all running in real time. And then I tell you, as I said the problem before, in terms of watts that just doesn't appeal to people, I have it in terms of euro. So now I'm telling you how much these appliances use a day in euro, how much they use in a month in euro. I have suggestions. I look at the data that I've collected, and I see personal, give you personal suggestions on how you could reduce your energy. And then the, the pie chart is actually really cool because it tells you which appliance is using what. And I found this very interesting as kind of I developed on the project because I found out my computer, in four hours of it being on, it had used more energy than the fridge had in the whole month. So that was an eye-opener. There's people in the audience that are either from startups, from big companies, and you know I've heard people say, well, in a big company you can't have you can't have this startup um, kind of mentality, and you can. Um, it does require work, but um, so we we what we did then was we developed this end-to-end -end system. And the second the second column of, of photos there, you can see that's an air quality unit in Enfield in London, and you can see the red square is actually the system we have developed to replace that air quality unit. Right, so significantly smaller. Um, what we did was we ran them side by side to actually compare the data from them, and it's, it's quite promising. So it's all about low cost sensing, um, shrinking the form factor, um, and trying to do it in, a, in a, a cost efficient and economical way. The third thing around the market, obviously cities are, is, a, is a huge play for everybody really, for both from a technology point of view and a societal point of view. But well, we have the backing of our president, so that's Renee James, um, and that's the former Lord Mayor of Dublin, Oshin Quinn. 
So they, they agreed to explore this, right, to really, really look at this. And I know Renee is very much interested, obviously from a technology perspective, but to improve life in cities. That's it, and it's very, very important. So how do we do this, right? So we can't do this by ourselves. We need partners, we need other companies to be involved. Um, we're heavily involved with, with DCU and Trinity in Dublin. And what we have is this idea of a living lab. So we want to bring our technology out into the wild to actually you know, test it, because funny enough, things don't always work in lab environments and in, in, uh, inside in that cage. When we bring them out, big problems, right? Big problems around when we start integrating the, all these heterogeneous devices um, from a comms perspective. And really what we're trying to do is to say, look, you know, we need, we need makers, we need developers to build upon our APIs. We can't just do, do this by ourselves. And we've, we've had we have three sites to do this at the moment in Dublin, London, and San Jose. And Dublin City Council have been great. Like, it's right on our doorsteps where they've allowed us to go and rapidly prototype. You know what? It didn't always work. So what? We go back and we do it again. Fail fast. Um, and it allows us that, you know, to acquire the data, which is, which is hard, right? To actually acquire this data and to acquire good data is, is difficult. Um, so that's, that's kind of what our, our, our model is. We iterate, we prototype. So our job as a lab is to be transformational. And we go from that research to POC to transfer to the to likes of business groups, the, the IOTG that Philip leads. So it's very important that we get the technology right. And this is one of our, our nodes here that we have. And sorry, thank you. This is just one of our, our, our uh, quark-based devices and our sensors. And I'm actually going to just show you a demo of one of those sensors live. But as you can see, we can integrate the sensors. We're moving to a more plug-and-play model now where we have the sensors actually integrated into the gateway. Um, so this is just a demo of, of one of our nodes live in Dublin, actually. So this is our dashboard, very much like what Laura was saying, just a view, a window into what's happening. Um, um, and we'll, we'll zoom in on one of our nodes. This is one of our air quality nodes in Dublin. Um, so we, you will see um, the various sensor types that we have there. So from an air quality perspective, um, you'll see um, the, various different, the various different readings of the sensors from a carbon monoxide um, level. And you know, at the start, we, we, we didn't know much about this, right? But we quickly found patterns, like so you actually could see, you know, during the morning traffic jams, the carbon monoxide moving up, clearing down, and again at five o'clock. So we've learned an awful lot of lessons along the way. This dress was designed by two sisters from Istanbul in Turkey, Ezra and Ch Ch Chuba uh, Chitin. And um, they grew up in a family where it was a big part of they were a big part of the fashion industry and they graduated in visual arts and design and continued on in the fashion industry. And they worked for many top companies abroad, such as um, Tommy Hilfiger and Levi's. And in 2006, um, they created their own haute couture brand and Pret-a-Porte. After this, they followed on with um, doing runway shows and their clothing has been used in films and um, music and lots of different areas. And in 2014, they decided they wanted to branch out and try something different. And they approached Intel with an idea of bringing, I guess, ordinary fabric and technology together and wanted to take a risk on that. And so what you see here is the end product of that risk. And um, that risk incorporated risks in both, I guess, um, on the technology side, because they were using a new chip that uh, was being designed by Intel called the Edison and also trying to incorporate fabric and technology together. And the challenge of the communication between completely different types of um, industry, I guess, as well. So um, it's been very successful. They've managed to develop this beautiful design, and they're hoping to commercialize the dress. Um, this is version 1.0. And they're going to commercialize the dress in January 2016 using the Intel Curie Insight. So I guess I'll um, show a little bit of a demonstration here. So. Firstly, what I've just done now is um, turn on the motor and the sensors, and Anastasia is going to show the butterflies uh, start flapping more as um, the object is approaching. 
When, when, so. when, you, when Martina says uh, the object is approaching, that's for the 20% of us that are male here. <laughs> we have emotional intelligence challenges. This is a non-subtle communication yeah, mechanism. Just turn the so, sorry. Demos. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to show you the magic now. So, if your cameras have them ready. And this guy's is when you get way, way too close. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I gotta freak myself. <laughs>